Hi, Tony from Songwriters Chop Shop here. In this episode of Songwriting Tips from Famous Songwriters, we're going to be looking at former Beatle and legendary songwriter George Harrison. George Harrison was interviewed at WABC FM Radio in New York on May the 1st, 1970, shortly after the announcement of the Beatles had broken up. During that interview, he came out with this statement. Because there was a time in my life where I realised anybody can be Lennon and McCartney. Because being part of Lennon and McCartney, really, I could see how good they actually are. And at the same time, I could see the infatuation the public had, or the praise that was put on them. And I could see everybody's a Lennon and McCartney, if that's what they want to be. The point is, nobody's special. It's no secret that the breakup of the Beatles was bitter to say the least. But if we look at Harrison's journey in the band as a guitarist that emerged from the shadows of two songwriting giants to write some of the Beatles' most beloved songs, this statement actually holds the secret to becoming a great songwriter. Born February 25th, 1943 to a bus driver and a homemaker, Harrison is said to have had a very undramatic childhood. At 13, heavily influenced by the hit makers of the time, like Elvis, he started playing the guitar. By age 15, he joined a little known rock and roll B combo known as the Quarrymen, soon to become the Beatles. Before getting signed, the Beatles were rejected by several record companies. Eventually, George Martin reluctantly signed the Beatles to EMI's Parlophone Records, and they started recording in June 1962. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I thought their music was rubbish. Although everyone in the band was encouraged to write songs, John and Paul had had a head start, but even they were only getting started and still had a lot to prove. Having to produce two or three, two albums a year in the early days and, and a single every three months, regardless of what the hell else you were doing or what your family life was like, what your personal life was like, nothing counted. You just have to get those songs out. Now, Paul and I turned out a lot of songs those days and uh, it was easier because it was the beginning of our, uh, biz you know, relationship and career. Anyone who's ever been in a band knows two things. Some members will be more driven than others, and some will be more opinionated than others. As a result, George found it hard to be taken seriously as a songwriter. Paul and I really carved up the empire between us, you know. George didn't even used to sing when we brought him into the group. He was a guitarist. He just wasn't in the same league for a long time. That's not putting him down. He just hadn't had the practice at writing that we had. With talents like John and Paul, who are probably the greatest songwriters of the 20th century as far as we're concerned, it's tough opposition. And they collaborated and kind of also rivaled each other in their writing. They'd had a lot of practice, put it that way. They'd been writing since we were at school. And so they'd written all the, most of their bad songs. They'd written before we got into the recording studio. For me, I had to come from nowhere and start writing and to have something at least quality enough to be able to, you know, put it in the record with all the wondrous hits. The band released their first single in October 1963, Love Me Do, written by Paul McCartney. By February 1964, the band's appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show had catapulted them into worldwide stardom. George Harrison was 21, and being in the band gave him a very unique perspective. The funny position I was in was that in many ways, you know, this whole focus of attention was on the Beatles, so in that respect I was part of it. But from being in them, an attitude came over uh, which was John and Paul. Okay, you know, were the grooves, and you two, you know, just watch it. But I thought, well, if John and Paul can write, everybody must be able to. <laughs> you could see, as talented as John and Paul were, that they were progressing as songwriters. Well, I think George realised what he was up against with both John and Paul, and also me to a certain extent, because I must confess that um, I would obviously concentrate on the guys who were giving me the hits. And uh, in the beginning, George's work was kind of tolerated. Oh yes, we must have a George song in this thing. It's kind of saying, well, it's not gonna be as good as the others, but we'll let him have it on, which was terribly unfair, I know that. And I do regret that. But you can't blame me because I had, I had to deal with two marvelous people as well as him. So George decided to take his own songwriting more seriously. There was no magic to it as far as he was concerned, and penned the song Don't Bother Me, which appeared on 1963's With The Beatles. This shows George that if he keeps practicing, he knows he can get better. The first song again, it was written basically as an exercise 
to see if I could write a song. I wrote that in the hotel in Bournemouth. We were doing a summer season and I was sick in bed. Maybe that's right. why it turned out, don't bother me. Mm. Yeah. But it's not a particularly good song, but it at least showed me that, you know, all I needed to do was keep on writing and maybe someday I'd write something good, which I still feel right at this point. I still think I wish I could write something good. They wrote, don't bother me, I remember, was kind of one of the first ones. And then he started to improve from that and eventually uh, became very good. Um, you know, get, getting like a classic with like something in the way she moves, you know, which is, I think uh, Frank Sinatra, I think, still refers to it as his favorite Lennon McCartney song. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Thank you. George now had two important pieces of the puzzle. He had a standard to work towards and he knew it was a matter of practicing. George had a goal to be as good as Lennon and McCartney and he knew he had to work hard and practice to achieve it. I, I guess George was a kind of a loner, really. Um, and because he was outside the team that were providing the hits, he had no one to work with. George's songwriting was painful for him because he had no, no one to collaborate with. And John and Paul were such a, a, a sort of collaborative duo that they would throw out a, a word of advice to George and so on, but they didn't really work with him. George was learning an important lesson that all new artists must come to terms with, something that's best summed up by this quote by Ira Glass. Nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste, but it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you gotta know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're gonna finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually gonna ca catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's gonna take you a while. It's normal to take a while and you just have to fight your way through that okay so George kept writing and it took a lot of practice over time to get things the way he wanted to bring his skill levels up to match his taste and so he worked away at it and he had tremendous determination and application he would he would um, craft his music uh, meticulously with every little stitch in the in the canvas and gradually built up his, his songwriting technique to a point where he became a great writer. He wasn't to begin with, but then he started writing great songs. And um, I've said something I think is one of the greatest song, love songs ever written. It's a wonderful song. You can see this progression in songs like If I Needed You, Taxman, 1968's The White Album, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, here Comes the Sun and Something from Abbey Road. We can see how much work George was putting into these songs. We can hear he was working on one of the lines and something for six months. It's in the head each time. Think of what attracted me at all. Just say whatever comes in the head each time. Attracts me like a cauliflower until you get the word. You know? Yeah, but I've been through this one like for about six months. You don't have 15 people joining in though. No. I mean, just that line. I couldn't think of anything like a... Songwriting is a numbers game, and that's one thing that must have been obvious to George as he watched Lennon and McCartney churn out so many songs. 
They wrote 200 songs during their eight year reign in the public eye as the Beatles and achieved 20 number one hits on Billboard. So even for the greatest songwriting team in the world, at the peak of their game, one out of every 10 songs became a hit. And that's after, as George puts it, they'd written all their bad songs. So as an independent artist, without legions of worldwide fans, you can probably put that number up to one out of every 100 songs has hit potential. How can you write a lot of songs if it takes six months to get one line right? Whereas taking time to fine tune a song that you have faith in is a great idea. It's probably best to spend most of your time writing different songs. Well, I've written so many songs that I've just thrown away as I've been writing them because I've wanted, when I've finally recorded one of mine, I've wanted it to be, you know, worth putting on the LP alongside Paul and John's. Yeah. I feel now I've got more idea about how to write songs. Yeah. It might sound a bit contradictory, but if an inspired idea or a song fragment is good, you should know it pretty much straight away. And take a leaf out of George Harrison's book. Write a lot, work hard on the good ideas, and work fast on the bad or average ideas. It all goes to learning the tools of the craft. Inspiration can leave as quickly as it shows up, leaving the songwriter to make sense of what it's given us. This is where the tools of the craft have to take over and enable us to develop and complete those ideas. And it takes commitment and practice to master those tools through formal or informal training. There's a classic debate about the Beatles not knowing any music theory and just being genius songwriters. And think what you want, but understand the difference between formal and informal training. Did the Beatles ever have a music lesson? No, they had no formal training. Were well, they exposed to a lot of songs and music from an early age? playing instruments from an early age, learning hundreds of songs, playing live and understanding what kinds of songs the audience would react to? Yes, yes they did. They had absolutely tons of informal training. It can be frustrating to spend months working on a song and it doesn't help when there's so much myth build up around the artist's process. We've all heard the divine inspiration speech, like how the song Yesterday came to Paul McCartney in a dream, or even things like how Sia can write a hit song in 20 minutes. But rarely is as much attention given to the less sexy, it takes work to make something worthwhile. Because even though McCartney dreamed the idea of yesterday, it still took him a couple of months to stop singing about scrambled eggs and realize it as the song we know it today. As for Sia, she'd be the first to admit it took me 15 years to be able to write a song in 20 minutes. Or take Mark Ronson for example and Uptown Funk. It seems like a straightforward, easy tune, but it took Mark Ronson over six months and a near mental breakdown to complete that song. And looking at the Beatles, they spent 700 hours in the studio creating the Sgt. Pepper's album. To me, as a songwriter, this is why George's journey is so fascinating. Not only is his progression as a songwriter laid out for all to see, but he went from being basically part of a boy band to writing some of the greatest songs ever and he did it all while being in the shadow of two of the greatest songwriters the world has ever known. He said, if John and Paul could do it, so could he. And by that logic, if he can do it, so can you. But it takes writing a lot, learning the tools of the craft and having a standard to aim towards because like George said, everybody's Lennon and McCartney if that's what you want to be. It's all down to the individual, you know, what you can uh, manifest within yourself as to the value of anything. 